Okay, so today we're going to be looking at one-sided limits. So this is a little bit of what we were already doing in our tables. We're looking at um, the values of y as x was getting closer and closer to c, okay, from the left to the right, closer to c, um, and from the right to the left as your x values were getting closer to c. What were the y values? Were they consistent? Was it going towards one y value? And what number was that y value if it was going to that one y value? And both answers had to be the same. So you know, end up doing this graphically, but essentially what you were doing was getting your feet wet for one-sided limits, okay? So in order for that limit to have existed, okay, so write this down, then your one-sided limits were equal to that same number, okay? This is very important. Um, not only were the two numbers the same, I'm just calling it alpha right now, but that they were numerical and the same, okay? So um, let's take a look here as you're copying it down. So this right here is what is describing the left-hand limit. You write your limit notation the same way as before, except where x approaches c, almost as if there's an exponent, we put like a negative sign. That means from the left side, okay? So it's a left-hand limit. Function, I'm sorry, limit notation. Next approaches c, but kind of like an exponent with a plus sign. That is your right-hand limit. So if these are the same and they're numerically equivalent, okay, we're going to call it L, then your limit exists there, okay? If L is 5, both of these answers be 5, you can say your limit's 5. If one of these does not have a limit, then your limit does not exist. If um, the answers are found, let's say you get 5 and negative 5, there's no limit because they're not equal, okay? But if both of them are negative five, then yeah, your limit exists, okay? So we're gonna be taking a look at some example problems using this concept. Hopefully you had a chance to write this down. And let's take a look at those example problems. Okay, so for the first one, they ask you to find the limit of h of t as t approaches zero and they give you a piecewise function for h of t. And we want to find our limit by evaluating our one-sided limits, okay? So, if we're looking at the values we're getting for y, as t approaches zero from the left, okay, maybe it's negative 0.3 or negative 0.2 or negative 0.1, something like that, something that's getting closer to zero from the left-hand side. Well, any of those values, the y value is zero. Now let's do the limit of h of t as t approaches zero from the right. It's so maybe 0.3 or 0.2 or 0.1 values that come from the right side of zero. Well, all of those values, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, even values that are closer than that, the y is the same, it is one. So zero does not equal one, the limit of h of t does not exist as t approaches zero. Number two, okay? Also get a chance to copy it down, and if you didn't copy it down, just pause the video and do so. Number two, so to find the limit of int of x, it's actually your greatest integer function, and that's why I also wrote it a little bit differently. There's two ways to write your greatest integer function um, as x approaches zero. 
And we're going to do so by evaluating the limit of our greatest integer function of x as x approaches 0 from the left, the limit of our greatest integer function x as x approaches 0 from the right. Wow, that is a mouthful. Okay. So I'm going to pull up another slide that I created because I was able to graph this on a graphing calculator and kind of steal that graph so you can take a look at it. Okay, so here we go. Um, with your greatest integer function, and you're not going to see this on a graphing calculator, you have a closed circle here, but an open circle there. A closed circle here, and so on. But what you're also missing, you may see a gap, and I'll try to use blue here. There's a closed circle here at 0, 0, and an open circle here um, at 1, 0. And there's a line segment connecting along that line. So I try my best with the blue. It's very hard to write on here. But hopefully you listen to me and can kind of understand what's going on. Um, okay, so with that, remember we start talking about values before zero and after zero, so we're going to do this one first. So values that are before zero are actually following this little line segment here. And all of those y values before zero were negative one. It doesn't matter if I said zero, zero was a closed circle, okay, we're just looking at the values before. And now Okay, and now um, I didn't realize that the video just spontaneously ended. We, the last segment was really where we're talking about the left-hand limit. So the right-hand limit turns out to be zero because we're looking along values for x um, that are getting closer to zero, and it's along that line segment I just described that's on the x-axis, and that is where y is equal to zero. So if you have two different numerical values, then the limit of your greatest integer function does not exist as x approaches zero. Um, I just wanted to make this note, and I want you to pause the video and copy down this note. Um, limits do not exist for when f of x equals your greatest integer function and um, x approaches any integer. Okay, and you can kind of see that along the graph. So when x is 2, okay, um, I'm sorry, when x would approach 2 and you're asked for the limit, then your answer would be 1 and 2. Uh, over here, kind of same thing. If x was approaching negative 2, you'd have answers of negative 3, negative 2. So um, they would never equal. So, just make sure you got that note, and we'll go on to number three. So, we're up to number three, and we want to find the limit of g of x as x approaches 2, when g of x is defined as a piecewise function. And we're going to do so by evaluating the one side limits. So, let's take the left-hand limit first. And so from the left of 2, you would probably have values of like 1.9, 1 1.99, 1 1.999, 1 1.999, 1 all of those x values. Well, all of those x values would be plugged into this expression here, okay? And so you would get to see what that would look like um, before 2. So I'm going to use my graphing calculator to do that. Okay, so you can see that the y values um, are listed here, and there's actually more decimals. So always scroll over to your y values and highlight them to see what they are. So as you go down um, the list here, you can view all the y values and all the decimals and see that they're decreasing, and there's more and more... Um, zeros as you keep kind of getting closer to um, when x is 2. So it seems like it's consistent. All the y values are decreasing. 
Um, they're not jumping around from negatives to positives. It's not going from 400 to suddenly four. Um, it's pretty consistent that it's staying from like 4.01 down to like 4.00. So we can say that your limit here is four. Okay, so this kind of uh, reviews doing uh, a limit with a table. We also could say uh, a limit numerically. So let's now do the right hand limit. Let's write that out. Okay, so I changed the calculator so we can take a look as X is approaching two from the right. So those are values that are a little bit greater than two and we wanna see as it gets closer to two. So what are its Y values? Well, it was close to four, but then it keeps increasing until it gets pretty close to four. And you can see um, exactly what that number is, if it in box there. So you can see that number would round to four because this would be about 3.999. So at this point, you could probably be in a grand. So it's definitely going to be four. And so unlike the other ones with this, even though it seems like a more complex function, its limit does exist. These values are in a grand to each other. They're numeric and they are equal. So the limit of g of x as x approaches two does equal four. Okay, and that's it. Good luck with your practice.